I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. For a free month trial of Treehouse, check us out at teamtreehouse.com slash show. In this episode, we'll be talking about icons, responsive images, timesheets, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we have this great article over on CSS Tricks titled Favicons, Touch Icons, Tile Icons, etc. What all do you need? That's a very good question. And in fact, this article is formatted in the form of questions and answers. It's pretty cool. I'll get to that in a second, though. Basically, a favicon, or sometimes pronounced fave icon, is short for favorite icon, and it was introduced in 1999 by Internet Explorer 5. A trend-setting browser. And it was standardized by the W3C a few months later. And they're basically just small graphics that represent the website. So you see them here in various browsers on a Mac, and that's sort of what they end up looking like. Since then, most desktop browsers have followed the trend and used favicons in some way. I know that because it says it right here. And the internet can't lie. That is very true. Right here we have a bunch of questions and answers, and I thought this was pretty cool, only because favicons are sort of this weird and sometimes mysterious file format that's not really as well understood as it should be by most web designers and developers, and most people don't really know how to use them properly. So there's a lot of misinformation out there about what is true and what is not. The first question is, what is the primary favicon file? Well, it's favicon.ico, and just to make sure that is not a PNG image that's just renamed. It's actually a different file format. Next question is, what dimensions should a favicon be? Three dimensions. Well, that's actually almost correct because there's a couple of different dimensions listed out here and then none of the above, and the answer actually is none of the above, and that's because a favicon can actually contain multiple graphics. So three dimensions was almost right, Jason. You're, you're doing good. I'm going to give you half credit for that one, so half of a gold star. Question, what is the purpose of a favicon.png? And the answer is it's complicated, just like me and Jason's relationship status on Facebook. Anyway, there's a bunch more questions here. It's really kind of a cool way to format a blog post because, again, like I said, there's a lot of misinformation about how favicons should be used, how they should be formatted. So it's a good way to test your own knowledge and actually go through each quiz question and say, you know, what do I really know about favicons? And perhaps you might be surprised. There's a couple of interesting answers in there. Is it complicated, Nick? All right, it's not simple. We're fine. Next up, we have a project called Focus Point, jQuery Focus Point. This is a plugin for, I don't want to say responsive images, but it's for responsive cropping. So this plugin will dynamically crop images to fill available space without cutting out the image's subject. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, let's say you have this particular image. Uh, this is two people in the rain, and uh, when you resize the browser, if you are trying to use responsive images, well, you might not get the focus point of the image in the frame, but if you use focus point, you can get their faces rather than their midsections in huh. the frame. I feel like that happens to me all the time on like Facebook or Twitter when I post an image and it crops the wrong part of it. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, um, Facebook could be using this plugin. Yeah. The only drawback would be you have to actually set the focus point yourself. So here, uh, let's go ahead and check out this this full screen demo. Right there's this picture of a lizard right here. Now if I if I go out of full screen and I start to resize my browser, you can see as the browser is resized, the lizard's head stays in focus rather than being cropped to some sort of strange dimension. So if we go back to the code, well, you do have to calculate your image's focus point. And once you do, 
and include the JavaScript and CSS. You have to create a container for it. And then using data attributes, you give it a focus on the X and Y coordinates, and then put in your images width and height also in data attributes. Below that, put in your image, and then all you have to do is call the focus point method, and you are good to go. Now, uh, automatically, images are refocused when the window is resized, but you can turn that off if you want to. And you can also change how often images are refocused when the window is resized. You know, maybe in case you want to improve performance and it may or may not matter. Uh, should you encounter a scenario where you want to recalculate the focus automatically, you can call the adjust focus method and that is it. So really cool plugin, very, very easy to use. If you want to check it out, it is in the show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse. You can also search for us on iTunes. We are the treehouse show. And make sure to join us for a 30-day free trial at teamtreehouse.com slash show. Very nice stuff. But that's a pretty interesting plugin. I'm not sure I would do it for every single image on my site, but maybe if you were creating like a marketing page and you had this nice big hero image, you wanted to make sure that it still looked good at various sizes, it would yeah. be a good use for that. Anyway, pretty cool. Next up is a wonderful article over on the CodeDrops blog called Making SVGs Responsive with CSS. Now, basically, there's a lot of different ways to embed an SVG into a page. You could use HTML5 and inline it with the SVG tag. Uh, the other commonly used techniques are to use the image tag, to use the object tag. You could even put it into an iframe and use it as a CSS background image. So there's a couple different techniques there. And the thing about SVGs is that there isn't really one single technique that's going to work perfectly and responsively on every single browser. And that's exactly what this article is all about. Now, I'm going to go ahead and scroll down the page here to demo. Actually, let me just go ahead and find it. There we go. And it shows all of the various ways that you can embed an SVG on the page. Now, there's another interesting part of this article, and it basically describes how to change an SVG as the size of the browser changes. So not only would you want to actually resize an image, or in this case an SVG, but you may actually want to change what it looks like because there's some pretty fine text on this particular SVG and I'm not sure you could make this much smaller and still have the text legible. So you might want to actually lose the text at smaller sizes. Well, how would you do that and what would it look like? Here is that particular demo, Adaptive SVGs with Media Queries. And I'm going to come out of full screen here just so I can resize this. So I'll resize my browser here and oh, look at that check that out. So it actually changes wow. to something that looks like that. So the text is still pretty legible there. Now there's your desktop folder. And then it changes once again. Yes, that is my desktop folder. And if you get a little bit smaller, I don't think we can. I think it changes one more time. But the way that this is happening is media queries are actually on the SVG itself. And these are not separate SVGs. It's actually just filling and drawing the SVG slightly differently every time. So it's maybe filling in uh, this particular area with a different color, and you're actually just seeing the same SVG just colored differently. And that's a pretty clever use of resources because when you're loading a page, of course, you want to try to keep the page weight as low as possible, and you don't want to load in a ton of different SVGs. So this is a great way to just load in one SVG and have it work for multiple screen resolutions. I thought that was a pretty good idea. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a project called Timesheet.js. Now, as you might expect from the name, this is a project that lets you generate timesheets on your web page. Now, what's really cool about Timesheet.js is it has absolutely no dependencies. This is just pure 
JavaScript. So you don't need jQuery, you don't need AngularJS, all you need is timesheet.js. Simply include this script, give it an array of different times, and boom, you get this nice little timesheet right here. Now you can see if we look at the data down here in from 2002, uh, to September 2002, we had a freaking awesome time, and that is represented by this green bar right here. This is all generated using an array of different dates and times. Now, if you want to check out the code, you can hit the fork me on GitHub button, and you can see in the source there is just not a ton to this. It is very, very simple if you want to go through and read and see how they did that. Now, if you're saying, hey, I want to customize how this looks, well, the SAS is included. You can change the timesheet classes and the different bubbles to be the different colors that you want. Anyway, this is a really cool project. Not too much to say about it. Very, very easy to use and uh, very easy to get started with if you want to customize it. So go ahead and check that out in the show notes. Very cool. Well, next up is CSS guidelines. I know that because it says it right here on the web page. Ooh. Basically, this is a... That is invalid CSS, I'm pretty sure. Yes, it is. That's not an actual CSS property or value or a selector, but it does look pretty nice on the page. It should be squiggled red. Right here, it says CSS guidelines is a document by me. Harry Roberts, that's not me. I am a consultant, front end architect from the UK, and he's available for hire. So you can go ahead and, and hire Harry right there. But this Harry is, didn't pay us to say that, by the way. No, no. We just will read literally anything on a web page. We will read it and assume it's the truth because it's the internet and it's never wrong. So never been wrong for me. This is a style guide and I think a good place to start with this is what is a style guide? Well, a, co a coding style guide, note, not a visual style guide, is a valuable tool for teams that maybe need to build and maintain projects for a reasonable length of time, or maybe you have a lot of new staff that comes on board regularly. Anyway, it's basically a way to keep teams in sync and make sure that everybody is writing clean and maintainable code that people will be able to understand whether they're new or whether they're coming on to a project that they haven't worked on before and so on. And it starts out with syntax and formatting, so very granular and basic stuff. Uh, in this particular style guide, it says you want to use four spaces and no tabs, 80 character wide columns, multi-line CSS, meaningful use of white space and so on explains how multiple files should be used. And I thought this was pretty cool, maybe having a table of contents in your CSS as a comment that actually explains what each folder is and what each CSS file is. Anyway, this is a pretty large style guide, and you could, of course, create your own style guide if you wanted to, but if you don't have that kind of time and you just want to go ahead and use a pre-built CSS style guide, this is a... Uh, Pretty good one to use. You yeah, can just go ahead and pick it up. There's lots of style guides for many different programming languages and very, very useful just to keep everybody on the same page. That is correct. Anyway, that's all we have time for. I am at Nick RP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Cypher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out our show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse. You can also find us on iTunes. We are The Treehouse Show, and please don't forget to rate us. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com slash show for a free month of Treehouse. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week.